Hello, this is Shackleton the Explorer, keeping me warm. It's rather cold in here, and I'm uh, Paul Beckwith. And today we're going to talk about the uh, tropics. So, I'm going to talk. I'm going to show you lots of um, good graphics, plots, maps, diagrams on some of the phenomena that occur in the tropics and how it relates to the overall climate system. So first and foremost, of course, is the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Basically, the uh, sea surface temperatures of the tropical Pacific, and it has a lot to do with how uh, heat is transferred uh, between the oceans and the atmosphere. So um, I'm using figures and plots in the BAMS, Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, uh, which is focusing on how 2020 was different from previous years. And this, this report um, came out uh, about a month ago or so now. So in terms of the ENSO or El Nino, I'll show you stuff on the Oceanic Nino Index or ONI. We basically had a mild El Nino the beginning, the first six months of 2020, where the temperatures were um, about, about up to about half a degree warmer than normal in the central um, equatorial Pacific, where they m m determine the indexes from. And then that transitioned to a moderate La Nina, where the temperature was, sea surface temperature anomaly was minus 1.3 degrees Celsius. So I talk all about these SST anomalies and how they vary on maps and also how they vary uh, with depth. And then where the water is warmer, there's more radiation, um, long wave radiation that goes up into space. So I'll show you some maps on that. And then on the wind vectors and on the jet streams, um, in the tropics, also the intertropical convergence zone, the regions where there's a lot more rainfall. Now, monsoons are a huge and very important um, phenomena on the Earth, and we're getting more and more monsoons. As the jet streams slow, and uh, I think this guy wants to get away. Okay, you, you've earned your freedom. When the... Um, jet streams slow down, the weather patterns are more determined by the land-ocean contrast and topography on the Earth. Now, in terms of the land-ocean contrast, during the summer months, of course, the continents heat up a lot more than the ocean. So the continents are very, very warm. So you get a lot of air heated above the land surfaces and you get a lot of convective um, effects where the air rises up creates a low pressure on the surface and that pulls air from over the oceans onto the land and because the air originating the o originating over the oceans has been um, laden with moisture from evaporation of the ocean water as that moisture laden air rises over the land it causes rainfall and um, that's with the monsoon on. And then in the winter, the reverse effect happens. The, the land is cooled more than the ocean, so the convective um, air um, phenomena are occurring over the oceans. So that creates a low pressure area over the oceans and that draws in air from over the land, which is dry air. Okay, so that's the monsoon off condition. So there's there's eight regional monsoons, and I'll discuss what's been happening with them. So there's the Indian um, monsoon, which people are most familiar with. There's the West North Pacific monsoon, the East Asian monsoon, North American monsoon, North Africa monsoon. Then there's South America and South Africa monsoons, and also the Australian. So I'll discuss those. And of course, tropical storms are basically a phenomena that starts in the tropics with the generation of a lot of these storms because the sea surface temperature is so high. Um, so I'll talk about the um, 
cyclones in the different regions of the world um, and uh, you know how they're measured we use something called ACE or um, which is um, accumulate accumulating um, convective energy so the total energy accumulating from all of these different storms and we can so not only do we look at the number of storms that occur the number of um, tropical storms that occur over the planet but also the uh, some cumulative total of the energy derived from all of these storms so we're going to talk about all of these sort of things and relate it to the overall big climate picture okay so this is the article or the report rather that I'm discussing and uh, so it's part of the BAMS report state of the climate in 2020 uh, which you can download and we're looking specifically at the tropics region okay so here's a figure of the oceanic Nino index okay which is basically the sea surface temperature anomaly in the regions of the tropical Pacific and this is this is in 2019 to 2020 and you can see it was positive it was pushing up to about plus 0.05 which is very very weak tendency towards the El Nino and then it dropped down um, this is April May June it sort of in, in 2020 it dropped down to below zero and it reached about minus 1.3 degrees Celsius so we transitioned from a very very weak El Nino that year to a uh, moderately strong La Nina. This is the um, sea surface temperatures, the real values of the temperatures. So we reached in this region here, we reached about 32 degrees Celsius. So very, very hot sauna type ocean conditions. Okay, and that was maintained throughout this region um, in 2020. This is the sea surface temperature anomaly. So this is divided into December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, 2020. And this is the temperature anomalies. And you can see the characteristic El Nino or La Nina sort of cooling here um, in the, <coughs> the mid-Pacific, uh, um, bracketing the equator. So this is, of course, indicative of the La Nina condition. And this here was kind of a weak, weak El Nino, but you can't really see too much warming here off South America. Now, how does the water temperature, the sea surface temperature vary with depth? Okay, so if we take a slice from here to here and go down um, into the ocean to 300 meters, this is the temperature in the four seasons December January February March April May June July August September October November um, and this is the um, so this is going across the Pacific and what you can see is you know as the months you've got some warmer water here this is the temperature subsurface temperature anomaly you've got some water here this is up to about between three and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius uh, positive temperature anomaly here and then this fades away and you get a cooling developing here and here which is indicative of the La Nina um, and this water here this is about minus 4.5 to minus 5.5 degrees Celsius colder than normal in this region so this correlates to what you see here the colder water here this is a temperature slice here going down in depth from here to here down about 400 meters and this is how you see so you see that the um, the effects here the warmer water here is is on in the western Pacific down to you know the peak is about 150 meters or so and the colder water is in the uh, East Pacific this is a depth of about a hundred meters or so and the water temperature is 5.5 degrees uh, Celsius below 
below normal. Okay, so what here we have, um, so because of the water temperatures being hotter over on this side and cooler over on this side, you can see this is the, the um, there's more radiation reflected out to space from hotter surfaces than colder surface. So this is the outgoing long wave radiation in watts per meter squared, the anomalies in the different regions um, at the different times of the year. And you can clearly see the effects of the warmer water here and the colder water here. Okay, now this is the, um, this is a wind speed and this is about 1.5 kilometers above the surface of the ocean. And you can get, you, the positive anomalies are the brownish and the negative anomalies are the purplish and bluish. And what you can see here is that, uh, you know, as the La Nina develops, uh, you can see a slowing down of the wind here. Um, and this is, um, this, the, the wind pattern is going across here. Then you get the heating of the air, it rises up and then it comes across and comes back down. And that's the typical walker circulation that you see occurring. Um, for the stage of, of uh, La Nina, which is the cooling of the ocean surface there. Uh, these are some more wind vectors, but these are at this, the height of the jet stream. These are anomalous wind speeds at 200 hexapascal um, through those four months, four, four seasons rather, dividing the year up into four components, three months long. So September, October, November, you can see that the um, the anomaly, okay, so this is movement, the errors are going this way. So, so, so this, is a, this is the upper limb of the walker circulation where the air is moving from the east to the west. Okay, so on the, on the surface, the air is moving this way, then it rises up and then it moves this way um, at the height of the jet streams. And this, is, this happens typically during uh, La Nina um, situations. This is uh, some more diagrams of the optical long wave or outgoing long wave radiation, um, the anomalies. And uh, you can see you get these different patterns that move across. This is moving forward in time from, um, from January. Um, for, for, this is throughout the year, okay? From the, throughout the year. So time is increasing as you come this way and you can see the different distributions of the latitude, the longitude rather, at which the optical long wave radiation at the equator is, is changing. And this is, uh, there's a progression of the, these, um, call it the Madden-Julian oscillation. And generally what you see is you get a movement of these different waves um, in, in this uh, circle if you plot it in a polar graph. So 10th of January, 15th of January, 20th, you get a progression of these waves and that's known as the MJO or Madden-Julian oscillation effect. And so you get these different waves here appearing. So, so this is what happens. This is a heat content of the ocean as a function of longitude. And what you can see is you know, you get this heat moving across here and this, heat, you know, these are the warmer areas, the dashed lines and the colder areas, the dotted lines. And eventually you end up at the end of the year with a lot of cold water at the surface, um, which I showed you on the maps previously. This is across the Pacific. So you see the cold water on the surface, uh, which are indicating the strong La Nina situation um, that's occurring. Okay, uh, this is rainfall rates um, at different longitudes as we go across the Pacific. Okay, so remember if I go back to the map here, you know, this is taking, this is about 100, and, so it's from about 150 east. It's, it's basically from here to at the equator. We're looking from here to here on all these longitudinal um, diagrams here. Okay, so that's from here to here. And what you can see is the 
um, rainfall rate in terms of millimeters per day on average at the different um, latitudes. And you can see a peak here and a peak here going to one big peak. This is the intertropical convergence zone where you get the rainfall. You can see how it basically, um, how, how it's situated spatially across here. And you can see where it peaks here. So this is January to March. And then April to June, it's, it seems to be stronger, right? More well-defined. Then there's a sub-peak over here. Then, then July through September, it's here. And then October through de December, it's here. And you get a second peak developing. So this is how the ITCZ has varied. And you can see the, la the latitude at which these lines occur, okay? And shifts of it and so on. Um, and this is the um, this is the anomalies on a map here. The anomalies, the rainfall anomalies per day. So lots of rainfall here where the ITCZ is, and less rainfall on either sides of it. This is an average from October to December for each year is all the different lines, and then for 2020 is the black line. So you get lots of rainfall here at about uh, seven or eight degrees north, and you get a, a peak which is broader at about 10 degrees south. This is in 2020. This is what the blue um, is the line of La Nina's, averaged over 11 La Nina years. And then neutral is the green line. And then when there's an El Nino, you can see that the rainfall is more distributed here more uniformly distributed in a broad peak, the red peak. This is an average of eight El Nino years. So we're definitely, so the rainfall pattern is clearly showing that we had a moderate La Nina this year. Um, this is a sea surface temperature anomaly, but this is um, Africa to uh, the, the uh, north uh, east of uh, South America. Okay, and you can see the um, the rainfall here, and and you can see the the temperatures rather, sea surface temperatures, and the uh, you know the, the the level the the index how high they were the anomaly above above normal. Okay, now the monsoons, uh, like I said in the introduction, are very very important. Okay, so the regional monsoons, there's about eight of them. And as we go to a warmer and warmer world with the much warmer Arctic and much weaker and wavier jet streams, then the effects like land ocean contrast and topological effects become that much more important for determining the weather patterns that we experience. And so monsoons are a big, huge part of it. And of course, there's always been monsoons in the equatorial regions where the water is warmer. So we have the Indian monsoon, the Western North Pacific monsoon, East Asian, North American, South American, North Africa, South Africa, and Australian monsoons. And these are regions. Um, so this, for example, shows the precipitation uh, anomaly per day. Um, and this is in the southern A is the southern hemisphere summer monsoon season, November 2019 to April 20th, 20. So in the, when the southern hemisphere is in summer, you get these heavy rainfall places in, in the green, okay? And, the, and not much precipitation in the brown areas. And then when we're into the northern hemisphere, um, monsoon, um, you see the changes in the precipitation patterns um, in the northern hemisphere monsoon regions. Okay, so this is showing uh, two things. It's showing the green lines are the um, precipitation, normalized summer mean precipitation in the green lines, and the red lines are the circulation indicating that a monsoon is going on. Okay, so air circulation patterns. And what you can see, this is plots from 1980 to 2020 in each of those different monsoon regions, in the eight of them. 
Now what really stands out here is the northern Africa monsoon is the last few years it's been getting a lot of rainfall and a lot of monsoonal type circulation. Okay, India has had very, very high rainfall and very high monsoons um, just in the last few years. But the biggest change is in East Asia. The East Asian monsoon was enormous here. Look how it was four standard deviations above the normal. The, the, the numbers here are in standard deviations from the normal. And you can see this, so half, so, so, you know, the sigmas basically. And you can see that there was, you know, enormous flooding in East Asia because there was enormous rainfall and enormous um, monsoonal type air circulation. Meanwhile, in the western North Pacific, it was very, very low. North America, it was, it was, um, it, 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 it was right on sort of what it would normally be, and uh, nothing much happening in uh, southern Africa either from the norm, a little bit lower than normal in Australia and South America. But again, the monsoons were enormous in East Asia, leading to lots of flooding. They were also high in India and North Africa and very low in other, some other monsoonal regions. So I would expect that as the jet streams continue to weaken, we can, we, we can expect to see lots more um, monsoonal type action, monsoonal type activity, and the monsoons that are already strong some of them will get much, much stronger. Like it, it looks, you know, I mean, will this develop into a trend in Asia and in India? We'll have to see with the more powerful monsoons anyway in, the, in recent years. This is the, um, the, this is the El Nino index. If you like the temperature in the SST surface, sea surface temperature index um, and the land monsoon rainfall. So. When we're in a um, when we're in an a La Nina, okay, when this is negative, it seems that there's a lot more rainfall um, in these land monsoons. So look at the land monsoon index in the northern hemisphere; it shot way up, and in the southern hemisphere, it was way lower than normal. In of course the the southern hemisphere in in their um, in, this is this is our winter, November, December, January, February, March. This is the Southern Hemisphere summer. So so it was the monsoons were much lower in the Southern Hemisphere, and they were much higher in the Northern Hemisphere. So it'll be interesting to see if this trend actually, if this becomes a new trend. Uh, this is the Indian Ocean. Uh, each different basin is looked at. So the Indian Ocean uh, basin. Okay, uh, here we go. Here we have the Indian Ocean, and this is the sea surface temperature throughout the months of the year, the anomalies. So very hot in that basin, and that created, um, you know, the monsoon we saw was, was stronger than normal. In for the, and this is the sea surface temperatures average in the tropical Indian Ocean. This is for 2020 compared to the other years. Um, Okay, here we go. Now, when we if, now we're looking at tropical cyclones. Okay, so across the planet. So this is uh, this is the tropical cyclones that we had from January through December, 2020, and you can see um, the sea surface temperature. It was very very warm in the northern hemisphere, and we had these different cyclones in all the different basins. Lots here on the in the Pacific. Um, lots here in in um, the uh, Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, and then in the Southern Hemisphere from July 2019 to June 2020, the season for cyclones in the Southern Hemisphere, we saw temperatures like this, and where there's warm temperatures, there's more cyclone activity. And if you look at the uh, named storms overall, there were over a hundred. Okay, slightly higher than the, the mean, you know, I think 104 or something. 
um, and then the, the cyclones were here and the major cyclones were here. So you can look global trends. Um, there, there's, um, you know, there's variation, there's fluctuation year to year, but it's hard to get a huge trend here, although maybe something's developing in the last, you know, five years or so here from the total number. Um, this is the ac accumulated cyclone energy. Um, okay, through the year, if you, whenever there's a big cyclone, you add it up cumulatively, and it was, you know, it, this is the, the, the mean here, so, you know, the total energy overall of the cyclones hasn't gone up, but people do say that the energy of the most intense ones has gone up. So this is global counts of tropical cyclone activity by basin for 2020. So 102 in 2020, not 104. Tropical cyclones, and this is how it's divided. So most in the North Atlantic, followed by the Western Pacific, followed by the Eastern Pacific, uh, Southern Indian Ocean, Northern um, Australia, Northern Indian Ocean, Southwest Pacific, and you, these are um, more intense tropical cyclones and major tropical cyclones, Category 5s. There were Category 5s, uh, and, and this is the uh, accumulating um, convective energy. Um, the energy, if you add up the energy of all the cyclones, you can get that number and compare it to previous years. And then there's lots of diagrams on each different basin. So this is the major development region in the north, in the Atlantic. You know, off Africa, you get these tropical storms developing, and then becoming tropical cyclones, building up into hurricanes, etc. Um, this is the number of named storms in the different months, so peaking here in September. Um, and the, uh, you know, the number of named storms, um, and um, whereabouts they're, they're, they're located. And here we go. This is the uh, Atlantic Basin here. And you can see the, this is the main development region. This is a region here where there's also been tropical storm generation and the sea surface temperature anomaly. Very, very warm here off the east coast of the, of the, of the US and the Maritimes. Very, very warm up here. Um, and you can see the temperature um, throughout the years of those particular regions. Okay, and uh, here's the, um, okay, so now we have the, uh, the West African monsoon here. Okay, and the sea surface temperatures and the, well, this is the outgoing long wave radiation. Okay, so where those storms are being developed are developing, and um, here's some, there, there's lots more images for each of the basin. Okay, um, so this is the uh, this is August, September, October. The wind vectors. Um, okay, um, again, it's off the. Uh, this is in the. Um, off Africa, in that region. Hurricane Laura, of course, was a big hurricane that hit uh, Louisiana in 2020, causing $19 billion uh, US damages. People have already forgotten about it because we had lots in 2021. Can look at the cyclone activity in the uh, Eastern North Pacific and Central North Pacific basins. So it's divided into the different strengths of the hurricanes and the accumulated convective energy. So lower than normal in this particular region. Um, and you can see, um, you know, so here's we are, here we are in the Pacific. These are the, the water temperatures, the sea surface temperature anomalies and uh, data on the wind, um, both near the surface and the anomalies. Um, more, uh, um, this is optical outgoing long wave radiation again. Um, let's go to the next diagram. So this is the uh, number of tropical storms, TSs, typhoons, and super typhoons per year in the Western North Pacific. Okay, so data in the Western North Pacific. 
and here we go for this is the indexes the the ace was again low in that particular region um, and this is the um, something called the uh, the Genesis um, index for these where, where these storms are developing here in the uh, West Pacific and then there's more of these type of plots for the uh, for the West Pacific and I want to and then the Indian Ocean the temperatures and where the storms are being generated um, there's more of these South Indian Ocean Basin okay um, so there's all kinds of data if you want to specifically get it on these regions but what I want to get to is uh, so this is Southwest Pacific um, yeah so here here's what I so these are the um, tropical cyclone um, intensities if you like um, in kilojoules per centimeter square the intensities of the storms and you can see the anomalies and it's divided up into all the different regions here so so we have uh, the northern Indian Ocean the southern Indian Ocean we have the West Pacific the East Pacific the South Pacific Ocean we have the Gulf of Mexico here and this is enlarged to this diagram and we have the Atlantic so we've got all of these different regions and these are the anomalies of the high energy in those regions um, and uh, so you can see and also you can see the tracks of the storms as well okay so there's all this data here um, and uh, yeah so obviously you know the tropics are crucial part of the climate system um, but the uh, you know the Arctic the poles are warming much much faster than the tropics right and that makes the jet stream go slower and be, and it's wavier and it stalls out and it's the reason why we have extremes of um, weather extremes we're increased we're getting a higher frequency and severity and duration of of extreme weather events like tropical rains leading to floods and also um, drought conditions in other regions and that's because the Arctic is warming that much faster than the rest of the planet but we still have to remember that the tropics are actually changing significantly and I hope this video has explained some of the ways in which the tropics are changing thank you for listening and uh, please remember to check out my website um, there was just a new posting um, a status report on the global oceans which was just posted and also um, you know you can go directly to my YouTube channel uh, Paul, just Google Paul Beck within YouTube um, and also my uh, Facebook um, account and my you know just uh, Paul Beckwith in Facebook and uh, Twitter also um, at Paul H Beckwith so please be sure to follow my work and please consider uh, donating at my PayPal to support my work and a lot of the work that you see I will be uh, I'm actually preparing because I'm off to uh, the COP26 in uh, which is being which is in Glasgow Scotland the first two weeks of November so I'm leaving in about a month bringing all kinds of materials and I'll be involved in all kinds of presentations and I'll also do a little bit of uh, crowdfunding to uh, help offset the costs of my flight and hotels and things on the on the trip to the to the cop so thanks again for listening and uh, please remember to check out my website, paulbeckwith.net. Bye for now.